Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining. We're going to get started. I'm so excited to hear tonight from Mary Jane Dunphy and Cindy Tran with a guest introduction by Lala Osman. My name is Laura Henderson. I'm the Director of Learning and Community Engagement here at the Poetry Project. It is so good to be with you in this room tonight. Before we move forward with tonight's event, I want to spend a little while reflecting together on this room. And if you are joining us on live stream, and so are not in this room with us, yes you are. Your presence is still felt. We are still together. In this room, the Poetry Project has presented events for more than 55 years. That means that here in this room, hundreds upon hundreds of hours of attention has been paid. And as Simone Weil teaches us, attention is a kind of prayer. A prayer for what, we might ask. It means that in this room, friendships have formed, community has grown, Work has been presented that is both vulnerable and incendiary. Worlds have been made and unmade too. In this room, voices have been silenced, stories have been erased, participants have been excluded. Part of our being together in this room tonight means that we agreed to resist that history of erasure and exclusion, to ask different questions about the story of how we got here and where we will go now. This room is inside St. Mark's Church, which is built on the site where Peter Stuyvesant constructed his family chapel in 1660. Stuyvesant was once described to me as the original law and order mayor of New York, overseeing continual colonization and enslavement as he increased the population of enslaved Africans in the colony, enslaving 40 people himself alone. Part of our being in this room tonight means we agree to remember this story and to ask ourselves in what ways we are accountable to it and how that accountability might look. This room is in the East Village of New York City, a neighborhood marked by gentrification and displacement and by community organizing and joyful subversion, too. We remember and retell both stories. In this neighborhood, the first penitentiary in New York City was built in 1816. As Tongo Eisen Martin teaches us, if it has a prison, it is a prison, not a city. So we move towards the acknowledgement that this is not our city, but an entanglement of forces that we must work ceaselessly to see more clearly so that we can act more surely towards its abolition. This is a room on stolen land. We are gathered right now in this shared moment on the unceded homeland of Lenape people. Lenape Kokin. There is only one thing we can do on and with stolen land, and that's return it. Remembering that to return the land is not a matter of transferring capitalist ownership, but as many indigenous thinkers have taught us, a radical rethinking of ownership and belonging, centering indigenous autonomy and active relationality and responsibility. To reiterate Gloria Anzaldua's assertion, this land was Lenape Hoking always and is and will be again. We must hold a lot as we gather together in this room that holds us. And so I ask us all now to take a moment to arrive in this space together so that we may gather in a way that is guided by our care and accountability for each other, for our many histories, and for everything yet to come. Let's please take a moment. have a few final reminders and updates before we move forward with tonight's program. Um, please keep your masks on whenever you are inside. There are two all-gender restrooms located upstairs and another here on the first floor through the sanctuary. Just let me or anyone on staff know if you need access to that one um, and we'll get you over there. 
Uh, and then to give you an outline of our time together tonight, we'll hear first from Mary Jane, and then we'll screen a short film that Cindy made, uh, and then uh, we'll close out with a reading by Cindy introduced by Welcome. Um, and so to begin, it is my great honor to introduce Mary Jane Dunphy. Quote, let me tell one story, one whole story, Dunphy writes. In this request, there is also a question. What must one include in order to tell a story whole? How many histories, voices, rumors, smells, sensoriums, geographies, weather events, women, neighbors? How much of a whole story necessarily includes what cannot be present in the most obvious sense? Future and past moments, all the lives a person could have led, the arsonists wish to start anew. To Dante's request, I ask another question. To whom would you tell your story? The reader, the speaker, the poem, the possibility of communication? I think the answer must certainly be yes. In Dunphy's writing, memory is always embodied, history is always alive, sharp, tender as longing, a kind of building's Roman, but with a constitutively wider focus. Dunphy writes, quote, my mother and I sewed a case for my banjo together using floss and an old coral curtain I had picked out from one of the abandoned houses on our property, end quote. It's a poem about growing up and hopping trains, moving out or just along. It's intimate, it's textural, both personal and communal. Another piece of a whole story, Dunphy is forever weaving, a thread for each of us, a case to carry us to a reparative unknown, quote, the terror of actual freedom, end quote, a place where we can land. Please join me in welcoming Mary Jane Dunphy. I couldn't see it or hear it, 
But every time a gust of wind blew, I felt it try to rip and pull at something inside of me, reminding me that every time it was free and hungry. In this dream, there were hundreds of families gathered to offer something to the demon. They all had lost children, and so in order to pay homage, each brought an article of clothing to a field and tied it together in the shape of a giant owl. Her back, there were backpacks and jackets and scarves. All of the parents were crying crying so loud, it echoed across every moment of the dream. I tried, but I couldn't trap it either. I woke up like a strangled victim, heaving. Santa Cruz, part one. I lived in a hand-built fort in the redwoods with a group of boys. Every morning, I woke up to the smell of bay leaves and duff. I got lost at night from time to time and wandered till all I could do was lay down where I was, eternally circling back to a copse of cedars who guarded my path, <laughs> who guarded the path to my sleeping bag as if I had failed some secret morality test. Those trees were beyond dulling judgment. Their way of non-intervention could have made anyone paying close enough attention grovel and plead. Santa Cruz, part two. The carnival on the pier was still open, but there was a chill on the waves, and saxophonists started appearing in the eaves of the boardwalk with every falling leaf. Everyone knows that saxophones are the sound of autumn. When played solo, they are a celebration of loneliness, heard non-diegetically in every person who happens by. A brassy croon followed me around as the frost set in. I realized I couldn't stay in the woods through the winter. I was walking down the road near Scammell Street alone. Book ended with light poles, its center neglected, a dark curving incline and fold. Reaching the middle, I felt porous. It being summer, my body matched perfectly, air's consistency, so that for a moment I caught wind licking open a riddle in my ear wet drop like airy lead, query so obvious for any waking dream, groping almost clear chains words, who are you? Cracked cement, my confidence gulching that I might know spilled out and I ran. First place. I moved to a quieter hollow of a tree wept green and brown like a kind of second place where the dew pearls and life's bejewels abject monks cooing while they sleep in no kind third place and they drink fourth place milk with shit hands the lord's chalice i watch from no place now and feel like i need to call out or stop them but maybe I'd feel differently if I could stand in their place and transmute filth and touch a god. Sewing the banjo case with my mother, the knife saying goodbye. My mother and I sewed a case from the banjo together using floss and an old floral curtain I picked out from some one of the abandoned houses on our property. It took most of the night and we were both giddy like friends sneaking out during a sleepover. Before leaving, she handed me her pocket knife and kissed me, 
I met my friend in the crack of a sunrise and climbed up to the drain bridge that cut through the downtown Spokane soot. It's hard to run across the rocks that cover train tracks, and I've always assumed that design to be on purpose. I stumbled before we climbed on the back bed of a double stack, and I felt the terror of actual freedom. Learning that the fear of flying is not about flight, but the chance that you won't be able to land. I remember. I remember now how to burn down a house. Even in a deserted ranch-style subdivision of St. Louis, it's harder than one might think. First thing that comes to mind is the smell of gasoline, mixed with the thick cotton ghost odor of asbestos. It is much easier when a house is full of things. Life stuff is usually very flammable. The rooms I doused there were empty or full of trash, not fit for a bonfire. You couldn't spot a memory if you tried. Stonewall. I think my mom's watching from Spokane right now. <laughs> my mother lived in a dome on top of Bald Eagle Mountain in the panhandle of Idaho. We as a family were born on the lawless side of American mythologies. No social security numbers, no taxes. My grandmother buried a Cadillac in the desert. She was a cocktail waitress in Reno and Carson City. But these are just little glares of light. Let me tell one story, one whole story. I want to bring you there. My mother was born dead, peeking her feet out of the womb. The doctor had just gotten back from Africa. My mother was born dead the first day and born alive the second. The doctor decided to use a technique he had learned on his travels. My mother was born dead on the first day, with an umbilical cord wrapped tight around her neck, her face a stained blueberry, puckered, a juicy unborn prune, I'm sure she was glowing. The doctor placed his hands inside my grandmother. He has placed them in there and proceeded to rotate my dead mother around. He unspun her. I keep imagining gold thread on a spinning wheel. It took the whole day to do this. My mother was born dead on the first day and born alive on the second. She came out and something happened and she took a breath. She was the youngest of three children. The doctor told my grandmother that in Nigeria they had a superstition that if a child was born dead and brought back to life, a spirit could get inside of them and they would live their life possessed by another. My mother was born alive, and my grandmother festered. So it couldn't be avoided when her brother was walking to the toilet one night, and he saw my mother, four years old, levitating off her bed, three feet in the air. This is where you stop believing, but I still want you to feel it. Scared half to death, he jumped out of a window, and the rest of my mother's childhood she was exercised and enslaved by a moan, by a woman that knew her not as her own, but as a demon that could and should be rightly caged. My mother shines so bright. She is old now, and I can feel her. She gives me signs. She feeds me light. My mother has one whole clear crystal growing inside her. When she passes, I'll crack her open and swallow the entire thing. Carson City, Nevada. 
The divine western light shined a while ago on this strip of land. Electric currents guided material forces across immaterial places, polluting open space so vast and dark, meant for movements without a body or a sense of love. What continues to permeate are the scents of the desert, gardens hidden in flat vacuity. We can't help but wish they were there for us. Lily Road. It is 6 p.m. and the streetlights have just turned on. I ride in tighter and tighter circles until my bike falls down and I get called inside. It smells like dry pine yellow pollen swirling in the gutter with trash and dead hornets. The woman next door collects baby dolls and wears the same turquoise sweatsuit every day. Her husband won't let her have a baby. He loves children the wrong way. He wears a Speedo and American Eagle do-rag in the summer, feigning a veteran while spanging for beer with one arm lost from drunkenly climbing a telephone pole. I see him booted off our porch like a cartoon bar scene after taking a dump in our yard. He swears he has a bomb and will kill us all. Believing him, I laugh with a two mentality. I hear him beat his wife on the way home. All noise is communal here. We force swallow each other's tone. The road is narrow like the house and the yard. On special days, we take buses to the post office. Immense like a Babylonian library, I play hot lava monster on the dark tiles. Every metal looks like gold in my eyes. I could be in Hearst Castle. My sister locks me out of the trailer, and I wander around looking for centipedes under stones and smelling strawberry. I messed up. <laughs> My sister locks me out of the trailer, and I wander around under rocks and feeling too hot. I measure the luster of pine sap for the trees and tell stories to the stones and strawberry smelling pineapple. I build fairy crosshatch huts out of pine needles. I see a giant moth in a parking lot and believe I'm hallucinating. My mother works as a barricade part-time. My little sister is a librarian and steals all of my books for her catalog. My older sister sews false stitching in her shirts and whittles at her life light and airy balsa wood. My brother, dewdrop, quick pearl, you have to wake up early enough to see. It's easy to forget so many things on purpose. Lacking in this case can be represented by the presence of something. Blind contour lines drawn around what's not there. It is a figure of longing touched by a brush without looking. What I have loved so far, I have loved in order to be able to love you. Paul Ceylon, letter two to Giselle Ceylon Lestrange. Dream is the guardian of sleep. I dreamt of your funeral in a barn my family never owned. I cried though we never got as close as I had liked. The walls of the barn were a dingy white, the purity of chicken shit. Your friend shuffling around in straw, wet with tears, and spilled wax cups of wine. I wanted to sing you a song, call you back for a kiss, blue wisp petals. Our romance was light, spelled without the GH, never really started. Desire was a strawberry, squished between my toes confused by the real goal that is simply to know you, and that is why I cried. Just like air, 
Liken me to the air you're breathing, restless in the wind's embrace. No cell of love to keep me safe. Liken me to the air you're breathing, soft reminder something's changing, blowing the air into your face. Liken me to the air you're breathing, mingling with dying breath, air too spent by the weight of time. That's everything. Thank you. about 
while listening to my thoughts. I say work, and it says rest. I say work, and it says grieve your grandmother. Death cuts up your plans and fills up your days with dark. I make prayers in the dark, ojalá. And the night became fat with stars and bats flying through my dreams. This is the drama of the pandemic, a storm laughing at the stats, until there's nothing but a crying wadi asking to be held. We're allowed to cry like that. No one knows how far this valley stretches, but my body knows how to catch the sky, feed it to my dreams, and soothe my cave of pain. What a fine line between prayer and a plane. on someone's arm. Diane Zeyang. A tattoo begins with a dream inside, close fist. Then flowers blue and fan the memories of times we try to hide from pain. If we dare to look, Sylvia Lan, and lies with the flowers, the shaded future. This fortitude beneath our skin. I draw breath with my mouth and hear the rumor. About hope coming back with stars is true. What is invisible when hope sees you? Singing and waiting too. 
I love the sound of baby pockets of listening to me in the morning. My singing grew into this nest of wrestling and wishing. Because el corazón de la ayudama solo lo conoce el cochillo. I take all the kisses my abuela sent my hand and air. This is how I let go of someone's sad day. She said they get a motion until I was full of song and they were known for nothing else. My song has wings. It flies through the night and covers long of doubt and gloom. My song can hold and kiss the face of sunset. The music of waiting is this duet. Between the oakum of the sun and iris blues, a rose warms the air and the hours sit down to mirror the unfolding. I find and choose mixed flower heads to transform into a crown that fits the gazing day. Very body, this is what the hours say. Listen. I believe in putting our faces in flowers to be held by beauty, to be held by the eve of some clouded risk. I forgot my gozo and I said, bro, or the ruffled lysianthus, sword fire, lemon leaf. Today is a sun filled path where the future is multiplied and planted. Dear Abel, I believe in common ways of helping people cherish the foiled days. I've been asking myself, what is the price of wealth? 
Truth be told, no need to look in. I want to enjoy the sentence, and my mom didn't think twice when I asked. I learned looking fresh and free, but it felt good when Anyan said, "Quite tight," and I could walk through the world and be seen. I know that looking fresh is how the eye pays respect to the desire. I make one clean, cut across the head of misfortune. Me have fun, yeah. Is a question money can't buy. The men who sit in my chair ask for what they want. No one in this country asked before. Now they are learning to choose to see hope untangled, the laces of new shoes. To see how hope grow up, put on her shoes for mourning. This is the gift of Ibolachi, the gift of a long hush with no bad news. With no sirens hurting the hours or a body, away from home, here I say, Ishiele, and someone who loves me says, Ilele. Dear neighbor, a real home has a hallway between our sadnesses. May today be a home with many hallways. Miko, say you'll kiss the air when the year closes. Say you'll close the night with the solo. Gaze into a dream field. Feel the roses. Rest them in a hallway beneath skylights.
like the back door of night sweeping open to a tree. When I wake up, I want to know a little moon's rose in the fridge. Hoping for a good morning, la nuit porte conseil. It tells me to listen to the winter wind and its many hands carrying away the sirens, folding it into silence. The dream says, si tu ne peux pas passer par la grande porte, passe par la petite. The sweet form of bird amble this way, making loops around our lives on this tree. Open your hands to hold a gold flake mode. Dear neighbor, I hope we see each other soon. Dear neighbor, I haven't seen you in months. I've learned something about being in pain. I've learned something about listening to my guts. There's a fine line between what is plain and what is invisible. I see you. Dear neighbor, with a hand over your heart. Do you hear birds singing and waving too? The music of the waiting is a duet. Between the ochre of the sun and iris blues. I've been asking myself, what is the price? To see our hope grow up, put on my shoes, and walk straight through the invisible dike. Cast across our days, dear neighbor. I know something about the dark that lets sugar glow.
so honored and grateful that we got to screen that incredibly beautiful film. Um, and I'm once again so honored and grateful to now welcome to the podium Latham Osman to introduce Cindy Tran. Pleasure to be here and to be part of the audience that um, got to witness this film after, um, you know, hearing about it um, when working with Cindy a while ago. And so I'm just going to read this intro, which I'm very glad to do, and I look forward to hearing your poem. Dear Cindy, when I first read your poems, I noted strong lines and nothing else. You athletic, swinging a harness made from heart, trying always to catch the sunsets and sunrises, the grids of light playing with ceiling fans on desk corners, making eyelashes a fanfare, and each face a painting. You were trying, too, for the dark, to hit yourself to the blue hours, then aiming beyond moonlight, looking for the arm curled under a chest, under covers, many hours before sunrise. That quiet dark that knows me. Dear Cindy, are you waiting? Are you singing? Are you singing? Are you waning? What are you making room for? What did the hours announce? Dear Cindy, what was at the bottom for you? What did you look up at from down in the well? The well we each had to stand inside, tunneled away from the ordinary rooms and their crowds, from the administration of daily life. My dear Cindy, who doesn't forget the honey or the onions, or the one who stands alone at an open door. Did you feed your dreams, Cindy? Did the small boat some fruits make carry you to a realm with more citrus, more embrace, everything open, only the expected things closed, a fist, a possibility, a heart, a future, the door that wasn't for you anyway the house that wasn't enough for you anyway. Thank you, Lydon, for that it's a beautiful letter. I wasn't expecting that. I almost tried it. I first met Leda at Nemo Ferrer's show at The Loft in Minneapolis. Uh, she had this poem that I specifically remember called Invocations, and it made me laugh and want to write at the same time. It's, it's this poem on curses. I highly recommend check it out, and you can still see it online. I'm so sorry for plugging you, but it's just, I revisit it, and it's great. And it also feels like a full circle moment to be in the audience, um, I think like six years ago, and looking up and wondering, would I ever be a poet? And now being here and introduced by you. So thank you for being here. I'm also excited that Up Until Now Collective, Brandon, <laughs> is here tonight to provide ASL interpretation. I don't know if you know this, but I was watching Brandon all night um, for the artistry of what they are doing. And if you get a chance, look over every once in a while to see. I was just so struck during Mary Jane's reading at, um, I think, saxophone in autumn. It just, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for doing that. <laughs> I hope to see you at more events. This is the, our third one this year. And I'd also like to thank the Poetry Project, especially Laura and Kyle. I came into this fellowship expecting to be alone and self-sufficient. And I found another world that allowed asking for help. 
Thank you for deepening my connections to the poetry world here in New York City. Shall we begin? I have seven poems tonight because it sounded lucky. The Magician at the No Man Hotel. The magician called my date by his name to establish truth. As cards shuffled through the night, he announced the numbers that came. The dim light and shuffle their senses. What is true inside the magician's locked wooden box is also true about the night sky filled with leftover light. Let's talk about the clock solution. Let's talk about air that can build. Uh, let's, I'm going to go backwards. What is true inside the magician's locked wooden box is also true about the night sky filled with leftover light. Let's talk about the clock solution. Let's talk about air that can build a night full of questions. Let's call it magic. Let's call it human longing that hides in thin air, travels through the heavy fabric of our coat pockets, and touches the sides of our fingers. Let's call it a slight of time, hiding questions in a voice box, making it chime. All bad at the Department of Motor Vehicles. <laughs> we need a path not to go from here to there, but to go from here to here. Jack Shokwong. Today I'm in line at the DMV with this old license, now expired. I wait for my patients to tell me. Feeling free includes the freedom to stay and to wait in the silk dawn, the body of day turning a clean path around my knees. So I wait, as in to be awake. Now I am learning to show my license to hours that don't wait. Morning on my knees, I feel the enraged distance closing between my lost Selves. The most significant battles are waged within the self. This world so filled with shells that show me there's nowhere to go. I wait with the sun as it goes nowhere. Wait. Wait. I don't think this grocery store exists any longer, but I lived by it for a year. And I have fond memories of um, this entire room that was a freezer or a fridge. Um, maybe some of you will remember it. It's called Fairway in West Room. Imagination placed an apple tart in my mind and told my legs to go down four flights of stairs. Maybe a kind of start. A quiet way to make myself a crown of sweetness sliced from a two-pound bag of galas. Yes, quiet and sweet like days of sunrises and sunsets playing tag, all layered and thinned out like hands in praise. And now I'm in the cold room with apples at my side and wonder how there's so much good butter here, how so much good happens, standing still like the butcher, never in a rush. He always knows the exact moment to say, how are you, and what will it be today? This next poem I wrote um, maybe four or five years ago. I, I meant to write it to women who lost um, their babies they were dreaming of. And then in the, in the following years, I mostly heard from men. I reread it a few weeks ago and I realized that if I just removed two or three lines, the poem became about holding onto ourselves when we are lost and accepting that we are lost. This poem is for all of us. How 
how to have a miscarriage all over the city. When platitudes like time heals all and everything happens for a reason, knock at your door, ignore. Ignore again. Buy expensive back tissue. Later, when you turn around and see blood clots floating in the toilet bowl, yank a long train of that expensive back tissue and wipe. Focus on the soft cotton fibers of three-ply that you never bought for yourself before. Everything happens for a reason. Ignore. Locate two old bath towels. Layer them in the middle of your bed. Wear a beat-up t-shirt and nothing else at night. When you give up counting sheep, count your own fingers and toes. Line your underwear with a thick pad. Place a lemon in your coat pocket and leave the house in broad daylight. Suck in icy air. Obey stop signs. Look both ways, twice. Aim to walk aimlessly for half an hour each day. Stop at a cafe and sit by a dusk blue wall. Order nothing. Gaze at your faux fur boots and ask the barista if you can borrow a blue pen. If there is no blue, borrow black. Treat napkins as a notepad and a manual. Outline a system of tender rewards. See one friend and you get to have sushi. See three friends at the same time and you get to have a sidecar. Kill two birds with one stone. Ask friends to stop sending cheap platitudes and ask them to buy you expensive bath tissue. Egyptian cotton bath towels and organic linen sheets the color of alabaster stone. Pay bus fare and sit in the second row. It is okay to look at the stroller, but do not look inside. When you cannot breathe, slip the lemon out of your pocket and place it just under your nose. Return lemon to pocket. Lift your fingers to your ears. When earbuds feel secure in their place, let out a sigh. When you return home, turn on the hallway light. Turn on the living room light. Turn on the kitchen light. Turn on the bedroom light. Turn on the bathroom light. Stand in the middle of your home. Sob into the new bath towels. Sob until you kneel and let your palms meet the hard floor. Take in the silence. Slip into the silence and pass into sleep. Dream of running down First Avenue, along the river and bridges and dams, past the landslide debris on the west bank from last spring's month-long storm and past the long-gone record store now replaced by a laundry that smells like flour and brown butter at 6 a.m. and pears simmering in lemon water at 9 a.m. and run into the ice cream store where you order hope and you get two scoops of vanilla drizzled with thin slivers of dark chocolate and you snort the difference between what you ask for and what you receive in a city or death where hope never dies an easy death. Check the weather report for today. Bundle of sorrow, bundle up and go into the wild. Cast line and bait into a thawing lake. Crane your head back and look at the old sky. last poem is about bananas. I hope it'll um, help you make bananas more meaningful. <laughs> <laughs> the story behind this is uh, I just woke up one morning early in the pandemic and 
you know, there, there's only so much you can do in your home. I um, think I walked towards the door very slowly, having nowhere to go. And I stopped in the kitchen and saw that maybe the night moved the bananas into each other a certain way, and it just looked delightful. So I spent the next several hours reading about bananas on Wikipedia. <laughs> So this, this poem is based on that research. <laughs> poem to bless the bananas that bless my day. You, banana, lying down everywhere in the city because you carry 14 months of blue sky and sunshine in your body, a comma telling me, come on, slow down. And suddenly, I don't know what on means, because I take little words for granted. But every banana knows tiny words have the most power, hearing them said from inside fruit baskets, meal trays, and altars, before and after prayers, before and after baskets. Thank you. Thank you again for being here. Have a beautiful, safe evening. Good night.